edition, Mr. Relevant. I'm Alex Strofe with you from the Everlight Solar Studio in downtown Madison, Wisconsin. Good to be with you on this Monday. Jam-packed weekend. As always, joined by producer Tiny Hands. Small hands, great producer Hunter Vaughn with me as always. What's up, brother? I should probably do the sketch thing. How you doing, yeah, man? I Everything was going to say, Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> special teams, special players. What's going on with, with him? He's taken over the internet the last few days, and I, yep. I, I kind of get it. Like, I, I understand who he is, um, but it, it's infiltrated everything. I kept seeing him on TikTok for, like, the last, like, probably year, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, I saw a, another TikTok of someone going, girls, go up to your guy and go, what's up, brother? And see what they do. Yeah. And every guy is responding. Yeah, my, my brain would short wire had that happened to me. But nonetheless, uh, good to be with you. Jam-packed weekend, Hunter. I was, in a we- or I was at a wedding Friday in Green Bay. Went to the Brewer game in Milwaukee Saturday. Went to Mesa Maney. Never been there before. Yesterday for WrestleMania night two. Um, so I've been all over the state. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Lots to get into. National championship game tonight between top seed at UConn, number one seed, Purdue, kind of the, the matchup we've been waiting for all year long, the battle of the Titans. I still think UConn wins big. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Jack Golke from Oakland, Pewaukee legend. He will join us uh, in about 15 minutes to talk the national championship game. Jack Golke single-handedly ended the John Calipari era at Kentucky. So we got to get his thoughts on that as Cal uh, headed to Arkansas after Eric Musselman leaves for USC. So Jack Golke will join us for for a couple of minutes at 1245. Looking forward to catching up with him after what was a terrific tournament for him. Obviously, huge rise, uh, a bunch of NIL deals, which which, uh, we're all big fans of, right? So I'm excited to pick his brain and some of that stuff from Pewaukee. I had a thought over the weekend in, in relation to the Green Bay Packers and how we view last year as we get ready for a season that will include expectations, right? A team that is expected to compete in the NFC North, a team that is expected to compete in the NFC and should be a bona fide playoff team. So how should we view last year? Was it a rebuild? Was it a retool? I know that was those were words we threw a lot around. Uh, last year, and I kind of am looking at that a little bit different after some of the moves the Houston Texans have made. Shout out Sketch. Uh, so we will get into that after Jack Golke joins us. And I also want to touch on the Milwaukee Bucks a bit later as uh, things not good for the Milwaukee Bucks. So we will uh, we will dive into all that. Want to welcome our, our audience on ESPN Milwaukee for the first time today. We will be doing this now every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday beginning at 1230 on the ESPN Milwaukee YouTube channel. Shout out to Joshy DiMaggio running the show for us in Milwaukee. Uh, happy to have him and excited to have him a part of our team uh, going forward as we uh, we join the ESPN Milwaukee family. So let's start with Caitlin Clark in the national championship game that was played on the women's side yesterday, likely going to break the record that was broken uh, on Friday. Uh, uh, was about, you know, what was it, 15 million? I think I saw the most watched basketball game in the history of ESPN on Friday uh, in the in the semifinal between Iowa and UConn. And then I imagine yesterday will smash that record as South Carolina completes the perfect season. They beat Iowa in the national championship game. Great basketball game. South Carolina pulled, pulls away at the end. Caitlin Clark um, obviously falls in her final collegiate game. She will be the number one overall pick a week from today in the WNBA draft to the Indiana Fever. And she took 28 shots, which I didn't even realize, right? Like, you just, I, 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 watching that and watching some of it back, I just wanted her to keep shooting because she's so damn entertaining. She is, in terms of, the wheelhouse she operates in, right? Like, so collegiate women's basketball, she's the most entertaining player I've ever watched. And it's somebody I just want to shoot every shot. She's so, she's so outstanding. Um, but, but South Carolina had a great game plan against her, as did UConn on Friday night. I mean, it's hard to slow down Caitlin Clark. She's still at 30 last night. But it's just not enough to get Iowa over the top. But, uh, I mean, she will be remembered as, if not the greatest, one of the greatest college basketball players, bar none, of all time. So that was uh, that was a really, really, really fun game and a really fun run for Caitlin Clark, who's going to go to the WNBA and elevate them to the next level uh, coming up next, or, or I guess next season, but in a couple of months with, with the WNBA season kicking up. Hunter, did you watch the game yesterday? Did you watch the Final Four Friday? What do you make of Caitlin Clark? Obviously, we saw Don Staley, the head coach of South Carolina, do something you don't see done really ever, which is while accepting the championship trophy and celebrating her team's perfect season, undefeated, 38-0, 
thanking Caitlin Clark for elevating the game. I mean, that's how much of an impact she had on women's college basketball, and she had everybody watching. Not only this season, but, but last season as well. It feels like for the second year in a row, the women's NCAA tournament. In terms of the level of players, the notoriety, the popularity, outshine the men's tournament, which will cap off its season tonight. But Dawn Staley thanking Caitlin Clark for all she did for women's basketball. Really cool moment, something you really never see in sports. Yeah, Dawn Staley's awesome. Yes, yeah, like is. I just loved that she did that. Uh, Sunday, I didn't really watch a whole lot of. I was kind of going in and out of the game. I had it up on my phone, and that just kind of got distracted with other mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, I was all in on the game against UConn, um, and that was such a good game. And I'm just disappointed that the conversation around that game had to be the illegal screen, which was very clearly an illegal screen. Yeah, I think the issue people had with it was it was it, it was only called what one other time? Three times in that game. Oh, three times total. Yeah. And so, that was the third? Yeah. They so, were okay. calling it consistently throughout the game. I'm with you. I mean I think it was I think it was clearly clearly an illegal screen. But Yeah, I, she threw her elbows out and her feet were outside her feet of her shoulders. Uh, like no, it was come on. Call. But I, I think for people that are maybe just getting into women's basketball, they wanted a last shot opportunity, right? And I understand that take too, but um, meh. I mean, they had their opportunity, but their teammate couldn't well, set the as, right screen. As we, as we That's what I, it just, it drives me crazy that people want to make that about that be the conversation around the game, not the fact that we saw an incredible Final Four game. Oh, yeah, we did. And I, I think w- when you look at it, and we talked about it last week prior to the Final Four, you wanted in the national championship game Sunday the best player versus the best team, and you got that. 38 now, what ended up being 38 now, South Carolina against Caitlin Clark, and you got it. You had an amazing Caitlin Clark game. Maybe not her best shooting performance in terms of efficiency, but she was awesome, as she always is, and, and South Carolina is just an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable game or unbelievable team, excuse me. So uh, it was really fun. I, I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I enjoyed the hell out of the run in the, in the whole tournament. And obviously the, the Caitlin Clark hype and excitement w- was worth it. And I, I hope that leads to the WNBA when she gets drafted number one overall a week from today. I hope people you know, watch that more than they ever have because I think she's that much of a, an unbelievable talent and, and can rise or raise a tide unlike anybody else. So looking forward to seeing how, how, how that shakes out. But really fun one there. National championship game tonight in, uh, on the men's side of things as UConn takes on Purdue. It's, it's, like I said at the top, I think it's the game we've all been waiting for all year. Purdue, UConn, probably the best two teams all year long. Houston, obviously, in the conversation as well. But it seems like really early. Early on in this season, these two teams set themselves apart, maybe with Houston in the group. Uh, I've said it all season long. I've said it all tournament long. I will say it again. Nobody's touching UConn. They're just that damn good. Um, You know, six and a half point favorites, according to ESPN, bet tonight against Purdue. They haven't seen anybody like Zach Eady, which will make for an intriguing matchup here in the tournament, but they've just beaten the brakes off everybody on the run here to the national title game uh, uh, in search of back-to-back titles, right? Uh, the, the trend bucked itself on Saturday of them winning every game by 25-plus. They only beat Alabama by 14, but they still covered uh, the 11-and-a-half-point spread that they were favored by. So that was, uh, by the way, those final four games, Hunter, on the men's side, just not very exciting. Right, no. and DJ BJ, DJ Burns Jr., who's going to be the star of one shining moment tonight uh, when that airs at the end of the national championship game. Between DJ Burns, Jack Golke, UConn, and Zach Eady, that will make up 75% of one shining moment. But DJ Burns Jr., meh. Also, but by the way, uh, I, I saw that Burns after the, the loss to Purdue was like all smiles, and he was talking about how he was chirping at Zach Eady during the game, and then he kept getting asked questions, was getting peppered with questions about going to the NFL. So I think you and I have spoken this into existence. We've manifested uh, DJ Burns Jr. will be the Packers' left tackle next season. I think, I think we've made it happen. What round do you think he would go in? No, he's, not, he's not getting drafted. You don't think somebody takes a seventh round? If he's like, yeah, I want to try and go to the NFL, you're not using a seventh round pick on him? Like, what does it hurt? Um, Unless you're striking gold with Brock Purdy. Right. Like, you're not, like, whatever. You, you want a proven commodity if you're using a draft pick on it, right? Because that also dictates money you're spending. 
Uh, DJ Burns might get an opportunity. I would be super freaking pumped if DJ Burns got an opportunity uh, in the NFL. We'll see what happens with basketball because I imagine it's probably an overseas thing for DJ Burns. I, I don't think he's he's cut out for the NBA, but he was he was exactly what you love in March and I guess early April uh, for for the Final Four. But he in the NFL would be the coolest story we've seen in a minute. Because he's just this, this as I dubbed him, the big mf from NC State who goes on this ridiculous run as, as a Cinderella double-digit seed to the Final Four, ultimately got knocked out by a bigger mf in Zach Eady, and maybe that can translate to the NFL. So I'm, I'm I don't know. I, I would love to see an NFL team take a shot on DJ Burns Jr., who, who didn't have a great game in the Final Four. But national championship game tonight, Houston, Purdue, Zach Eady will get his, UConn will get theirs. I think they complete the back-to-back championship run because that's just the trajectory they've been on all season long. They, they've, they've taken their bumps, of course, unlike South Carolina on the women's side, but they lost early in the season to a good Kansas team. They lost on the road, got smacked on the road at Seton Hall, and they got smacked on the road at Creighton, who was a good team, and alive late in, late in the tournament. So overall... I just I don't know how a team defends UConn, who can score anybody out of the gym. They run this unbelievable offense, and they're uh, I don't know. I'm just I'm very intrigued to see if anybody can or if Purdue can even compete. Like it might be close at half. I think UConn runs them out of the gym. I what I say six and a half. I think according to ESPN Bet as it stands right now, what they're favored by. I think they cover again. They win by at least ten points and. <sighs> They win back-to-back national champions, chips. That's the way I view it going. So we will see. We'll get some more insight on that right now as we go to the phone lines. A legend from Pewaukee, Wisconsin, 2018 grad. A legend of Hillsdale. And now a legend in March Madness. Going to be the star of one shining moment tonight. I'm calling my shot on that. From Oakland University, Jack Golke joins us now on Mr. Irrelevant. Jack, my man, it's been, uh, it's been a couple of quiet weeks for you. How are you hanging in there? <laughs> uh yeah not much going on lately uh no it's it's been good um just got back from the final four which is a lot of fun and um just you know kind of trying to soak up everything that's going on and i appreciate you guys having me on today yeah appreciate you taking the time my man and, and you know i i view it this way because you said you're on your way back from the final four i don't know if you have obligations or something but you're like the star of March Madness. They they couldn't get you into the national championship game. What's the, what's the story there? If I'm not digging in too deep. <laughs> uh, no, no. They yeah. So I had some uh, obligations down there to do, and and uh, had a lot of fun I was there. But um, I, I could have gone if I wanted to. But to be honest, I'm uh, you know as as soon as we were out, I was kind of it kind of hurts to watch the games. It's like oh, like I wish we were in that position. So. Uh, I didn't really necessarily want to stay and watch the championship. <laughs> that, no, that's fair. Uh, you know, that's that's the competitor mindset, competitive mindset. But to see you compete in this hot shots thing over the weekend, which you guys crushed, Jack, the first shot you had to make was a two pointer. <laughs> you didn't make a lot of those this season. I think it was eight total. Uh, first off, what's the story with with the lack of two point shots? And secondly, how fun was this experience at Grand Canyon University over the weekend, winning the Davis Hot Chicken Hot Shot Challenge? Uh, it was, um, well, I guess going before the season, when Coach Campy started to recruit me, um, he pretty much just showed me all of his film and, and some of the players he had had in the past who, who played my style. And he's had guys in the past who, he had a guy, Max Cooper, who shot over 250 threes in the season and didn't take a single two. So Whoa. he's had that, that type of player before and, and people to fit that mold. So he kind of just pitched it to me and, and said, uh, like, I know you've, you've taken twos in, in your previous stops of your career, so whether it's mid-range jumpers or, or layups, whatever the case may be, but I just he thought the most efficient usage of me would be uh, to stay behind the arc. And, and if uh, I'm taking out a three, to take a side dribble and shoot another three instead of going inside the arc. So, so that's kind of how it came about. And, uh, man, this weekend was a ton of fun. Uh, Grand Canyon had a – for us at the at that event and um like you said i had to take a little bit in that competition and i went over to coach campy before i took it and i said i asked him i was like how many attempts do you think it's going to take me to make this and 
And he said, oh, it's probably going to be three or four before you, <laughs> <laughs> before you ten foot. Basically, I made it on the first try, and we were going to go for yeah, that, that, that's fantastic. Jack Golke with us here on, on Mr. Irrelevant on ESPN Wisconsin. And, and Jack, I, I just want to go back to that Kentucky game and, and obviously some big news out of there, which we'll get to in a second, uh, coming out last night. But that Kentucky game, you come off the bench, you can't miss. Uh, you, you ultimately make 10 threes, uh, cr- creating and ultimately pulling off the biggest upset in round one of the NCAA tournament. As those first couple shots started falling for you in the first half, was the mindset just, I got to keep shooting if we want to win this thing against a really good Kentucky team? I, I mean, that's the biggest stage, obviously, I assume you've ever been on in your career, right? You're playing the number three seed in Kentucky, and these shots just keep falling for you. What's the mindset, and when did you realize, holy crap, we're actually going to pull this thing off? <laughs> um, I mean, the mindset is it's just, it's been pretty much the same the whole season. And, and the biggest thing that we said going into the game is we just got to our preparation and with our, with our, because that's at that point. And it, when you start changing things up uh, in the big moments, that's when I think teams start to falter. So my thing was this, uh, certain teams throughout the season who might've guarded me. And then I wasn't able to get up. But it, uh, We lose them. I said, All right. oh, we got them back now. Sorry, Jack. We we lost it there for a minute. Keep going. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying that the, a decent job of going. Our- All right, we're going to try to reconnect with Jack, who, who uh, I know he's driving. I know he mentioned that at the top, so we'll try to reconnect with him momentarily. Jack Golke from Oakland, our guest here on. Mr. Irrelevant. And, and look, I, he's talking about, obviously, that Kentucky win there, and we'll get to the news with him as, as we get back with him on, on John Calipari uh, getting out of Kentucky. I need to ask Jack, does he take credit for ending that run? Because, uh, obviously, a legendary run for Calipari at Kentucky. And Jack Golke breaks an NCAA record in his final game at Kentucky. So we'll, we'll get back to that here as uh, we try to reconnect. I mean, he's in Arizona. I assume he's driving back to either Michigan or Wisconsin. So I, I don't know what the cell reception is. I've never made that drive before. So uh, we will find out here uh, here in a second as, as Tiny Hands gets to work back there in the, uh, in the control room behind me. We'll, we'll give it another shot, Jack. We got you back. Uh, I, like I was just mentioning, I've never made the drive from Arizona to either Michigan or Wisconsin, wherever you're driving back to. So I imagine we might have some spotty cell connections somewhere in the middle there. But uh, back, to, back to the Kentucky game. You were mentioning the mindset as you guys uh, ultimately pulled off that upset. Yeah, so... When I, got it, uh, I realized, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to get some, some free looks. I'm going to get... I can, if I can, I can make a big impact on it, and and hopefully kind of uh, be a big part in in why my team wins. And kept going forward, and and kept that mindset throughout the whole game. And once they started changing their coverage and, and starting to pay more attention to me, the time to kind of distract and, and take all the attention and, and let my other teammates uh, thrive at that point, whether it's Trey or Chris or or DQ and those guys. So, um, it, obviously, it's such a team game, and and guys hot, it makes everything easier for But Everybody else started uh, scoring. Jack Golke with us here on ESPN Wisconsin. Jack, uh, I, I mentioned the news when you joined us before. Coach Calipari out at Kentucky. He heads to Arkansas to take over for Eric Musselman. So I'm just going to ask you point blank. You take credit for ending the Calipari era in Kentucky, 10 threes against him in his final game? You, you're taking credit for that? Uh, no, I'm definitely not taking credit for that. <laughs> um, he he could have been back if he wanted to, and uh, he, I think he saw a great opportunity at Arkansas. and. Um, Uh, the the collective that they'll have at Arkansas and the amount of resources available to him. So I think he just saw a fresh start and a and a great opportunity there. Uh, it has been funny to see all the all the memes <laughs> and all that good stuff on the internet though. 
<laughs> no doubt about that, man. You're you're a legend. You're gonna, like I said, you're going to be the highlight of, of one shining moment tonight. Uh, speaking of opportunities, right? The, the way the NIL era has has helped you over the course of the last month or, or so. Uh, I, I even saw you at one point you used the hashtag I love NIL on on Twitter. <laughs> given all the opportunities you've got, what what's the in terms of NIL? What's the last month been like for you? Because I imagine it's created some opportunities for you that 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 weren't there previously in your in your first and only year at Oakland. Yeah, absolutely. It's been uh, it's been awesome. I, I feel very lucky to be able to take advantage of a situation like this uh, with the NIL, and um, it's definitely been crazy. There's been uh, so many things kind of thrown at me and, and uh, offered to me, but just trying to sort through it all, and I've had some good help and in kind of looking at those those deals and deciding what's what's good for me what's not good for me uh which ones are, are going to last and things like that so uh just trying to evaluate and, and take advantage of the moment because something like this doesn't come around all the time and it doesn't last forever as well so so what's next for you jack obviously i know you're getting your master's degree at oakland uh, after your, your four-year uh accounting degree at hillsdale what's what's next after after that what what's uh what's coming up for Jack Golke? Yeah, so I just signed an agent about a week ago, and uh, I'm going to try to play pro this upcoming year and, and hopefully for a good amount of years down the line. So I'll be heading uh, down to Dallas this summer to train and, and get ready for a, a big season uh, wherever I end up. I'm not exactly sure where that'll be, but uh, I'll be very busy this summer, whether it's uh, workouts, uh, hopefully some summer league action in, in Vegas, and all that good stuff, and then maybe I'll end up in Europe or, or stay stateside. But I uh, definitely want to keep playing basketball. The game's been uh, awesome to me and, and blessed me with a lot of things, so I want to try to keep riding that wave. No doubt about it, and you certainly uh, have capitalized thus far. Looking forward to seeing what's what's up next for you. I want to go back uh, after leaving Hillsdale last year and ultimately ending up at Oakland. You're a Pewaukee guy. You're from Wisconsin. There's two schools in the Horizon League in Wisconsin, UW-Green Bay, UW-Milwaukee not far from home for you. What was the recruitment like from D2 Hillsdale to getting to that Division One level this year? Were there offers from the, the, the hometown schools in Green Bay and Milwaukee, or was Oakland really the one that targeted and ultimately the reason you ended up? What was that process like for you? Yeah, I had uh, a couple other offers besides Oakland, but uh, none other, no other offers in the Horizon League. I, I didn't really hear at all from Green Bay or Milwaukee. Um, so that was kind of just, you know, some added motivation when I got to play those teams this year, which was a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, 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 Oakland was a great fit for me, and I, I, w- I don't think I would have gone anywhere else, but it would have been, uh, it would have been nice to get a little attention from them. Uh, I, I understand that. I mean, we, we all have chips on our shoulder, whether that be as, as uh, a great three-point shooter or as a, as a uh, radio and podcast host or whatever, right? Like, we all have chips on our shoulder one way or <laughs> exactly. another, right? So I, I, I feel you on that. Uh, looking at, at Caitlin Clark, I saw there was a sign in the crowd uh, at, at the national championship game yesterday, Jack, that said, Jack Golke wishes he was Caitlin Clark. Is that true? <laughs> Uh, I don't wish I was Caitlin Clark, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for her game, and I know she's a beast. So. <laughs> she was. Did you catch any of that national championship game between Perfect South Carolina and Iowa? And, and what, what do you make of uh, that side of the bra- or that side of the tournament, the women's side, which was a uh, which was a terrific product over the weekend? Yeah, it was. Uh, I watched a little bit of the LSU game, and then and then did catch some of the game yesterday. And uh, man, it's it's awesome to see the amount of exposure and. Um, attention that the women's games get in these days, especially in college, just because obviously they put in uh, just as much work as we do, and and to see uh, the stage that they get to play on and and how much attention Caitlin Clark especially brings to the game is is really cool, and it's much deserved for her. I think everyone's excited to see kind of what happens with her and going pro, and and maybe she can kind of lift up the WNBA as much as she has the, the college game. No doubt. I said that right before you jumped on with us. I hope that's the case as well. On the men's side, I know you mentioned, I, I don't know if you, you're going to be watching tonight, UConn looking for back-to-back titles, Purdue uh, obviously looking to give them the challenge tonight in the national championship game. Will you be watching? Do you have a rooting interest, or is this, uh, I, I, I wish we were still playing, I, I am paying attention to this. What's the mindset of the, there? <laughs> um, I, I probably will watch, but uh, I don't really have a rooting interest. I think, uh, I think I'm going to go with UConn, but they're, they've just been so dominant the last, what, 11 tournament games they've played, and 
is winning all of them uh, with relative ease, and it's been so impressive to watch them play. And obviously the, the matchup between the two bigs will be exciting to watch, but the, the depth that UConn has and the amount of good talented players they have is really impressive. So I'll, I'll be tuned in tonight. Um, I was more so – not, I was more so avoiding watching NC State in That's particular. <laughs> Anytime they were playing, I did not want to see anything going on. <laughs> no, I, I feel that, and and you know, it was it was cool to see two double digit seeds match up when you guys when you guys played. But ultimately, I, I'm with you. I would have I would have liked if the result was the opposite way. But uh, last thing for you, Jack, before we let you go, and really appreciate you taking the time, my man. I know how busy it's been the last few weeks for you. Is it, it, I keep referencing one shining moment because I'm a ginormous nerd. Do you care about that? Are are you looking forward to seeing you hitting some shots and your face appear in that montage, or, or do you just not care about one shining moment? Because, I, I, like I said, I'm a giant nerd when it comes to it. I'm looking forward to seeing some Wisconsin representation in Jack Golke in one shining moment tonight. W- will you be looking forward to that? Um, I think it's cool to be in the video just because it's in, like, the history of the tournament, the, all the videos on YouTube and get a bunch of – views like when you watch or when you're getting ready for the next tournament and things like that. So I think it's cool. Um, but, and I, I know that that was a, a huge stage and all that stuff, but um, in terms of my career, I, I hope, I don't really like the one shining moment label to, to describe it. You know what I mean? I hope that uh, I can keep building memories and moments uh, for my basketball career down the line. I love that answer. That's a great answer, Jack. Dude, you're the best. Appreciate <laughs> the time. Congrats on everything and looking forward to seeing what's next for you. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Great to meet you, and thanks for having me on. It's Jack Golke from Oakland, uh, one of the tournament studs, and, and I know he said, you know, he doesn't want it to be his one shining moment, but I will pump my fist when I see Jack Golke pump up on one shining moment tonight. Because I, and, and Hunter, a few weeks back, and, and for our Milwaukee audience or anybody new to the show that's watching with us, uh, they didn't see after the first weekend our, I, I don't remember how many, we made seven or eight predictions of what will show up in one shining moment. I'm very much looking forward to going back in that list and checking off how many we got right. We know for a fact Golke will be in there. We know for a fact DJ Burns Jr. will be in there. But I'm such a nerd for this stuff, man. Uh, what, what was it? The cotton candy fan? I don't even remember what school. Auburn, was it? Uh, cotton candy kid from Baylor. Baylor. That's just going to town on it. Yeah. Like, I'm excited to see if, 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 uh, if, if he makes it in. So, um, do you pay attention as close to that as I do? I don't know if that's an ADD thing for me, but I get real into One Shining Moment every year. I mean, I love it, and it's just because it's a great song, and, like, it is fun, and then it is like you mentioned, like going back and watching them on YouTube, like it's fun to get that time capsule of that year's tournament. Uh, so that's what I love the most is like, I'm going to go back and watch, you know, the 2007 one shining moment so I can see some Joe Kim Noah highlights mixed in there. Like that's great about it. Um, but I loved what he said there at the end of like, I don't want that to yeah, be what encapsulate my career. I, I've got to imagine it's again somebody somewhere is going to take a chance on him oh, he'll be playing at the next level. He'll be in summer yeah. league, right? And, and you know if he can continue what he did against Kentucky um, and, and knock down some triples, every team's looking for a shooter always. Like it wouldn't hurt the Milwaukee Bucks, who we'll talk about in a second. Um, so we'll see what happens with him. But but even if it's Europe, right? Like great college players are playing over there. We just had that special that we talked about with Ben Bruss last week, a banner year, re- reflecting on the first of two Final Four teams from Wisconsin. Frank Kaminsky and, and Sam Decker are both in Europe. Those were both lottery picks, right? So Nigel can, Hayes, Nigel dropping Hayes. a fifty burger. I saw that. Yeah. So I mean, a bunch of these great collegiate players end up over there. There's some really good competition and good leagues over there, um, and, and you can make a good living doing that. So I'm excited to see what's next for Jack Golke. Um, and hopefully he continues to, to bring in a couple of those NIL deals uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks because uh, it's been cool to see, right? Like mid-majors, and you and I are, are big mid-major fans. Uh, that's now our second Horizon League guest we've had on this show. Uh, Coach of the Year, by the way, National Coach of the Year, Sonny Wicks won an award over the weekend from UW-Green Bay. Are, of show. are we the official show of the Horizon League? I, we've had two I, guests now. Here's the issue. I just don't know if there's a lot of competition. I don't know if that's Who says, cares? We're still know, first place. But I don't know if that says more about us or if that says more about the Horizon League. Um, take that as you will. But I don't know who that says more about. I think it says more about, about us because we appreciate the mid-majors. We give them love. <laughs> it, 
it's well deserved they work hard yeah. and yeah. yeah and everyone else needs to step up their horizon league game no that's fair yeah yeah i challenge every show on espn wisconsin to pay more damn attention to the horizon league yeah yeah uh all right let's talk packers a little bit because i had this thought over the weekend hunter um because we, we threw a lot of words around ahead of the NFL draft a year ago. So about this time last year, we were still in the midst of the Aaron Rodgers drama. The trade hadn't been finalized yet, but we were still operating under the idea that he would play for the New York Jets, which he ultimately did for three plays, but the trade ultimately ended up happening. And we viewed it in, in terms of a rebuild. And ultimately, I just don't think if you're a playoff team, you can call it a rebuild. However, I'm starting to change my tune on that. Because I think it is a rebuild. Like, as David Bakhtiari already put it a year ago, anytime you move on from a Hall of Fame quarterback, it's a rebuild. No matter if you're great, no matter if you're solid, no matter if you're okay, no matter if you're bad, you're rebuilding. And I, I, the Houston Texans are, are the team that popped into my head when we used the term rebuild. Because they went from three wins to a playoff team. And, and, and like the Packers, I, I, I viewed the parallels among them a lot throughout the end of the regular season and end of the postseason. Of, okay, these were teams that didn't make the playoffs a year ago. They make changes at the quarterback position, and they have a bunch of young pieces offensively. And both of them get into the playoffs. They both win their, their wild card game and seemingly have very bright futures with new franchise quarterbacks and C.J. Stroud and uh, Jordan Love, respectively. So I, I just think it, it is a credit to Brian Gutekunst and the front office staff of the Packers, the stability that they've had for three decades now, that – when you make a ginormous transition like you did a year ago from Aaron Rodgers, but also you eliminate pretty much every veteran piece offensively and bring in a ton of rookies, a tight end, a wide receiver, and somehow that translates to winning nine games, smoking the second seed in the NFC in the playoffs, sorry, Hunter, in the Dallas Cowboys, and having the number one seed at San Francisco 49ers on the ropes in the divisional round, unable to pull off that game but it looked like you almost were going to i just i just think it, it speaks to the stability and the genius and i'm ready to use that word of brian gutekunst and i know like everybody will have their special glasses on for the solar eclipse here in a couple of minutes i, I have my green and gold colored glasses on when it comes to goody but i just have blind faith in him at this point because what he pulled off last year is impossible for 30 other NFL franchises. Look at the Patriots. They were the gold standard for how long in the NFL under Bill Belichick. And they just can't get it to work with Mac Jones at quarterback. And they ultimately come to the decision to move on from Bill Belichick this offseason. It's not easy to stay as relevant as the Packers have the last three decades. And somehow, again, last year, they find a way to do it. But that leads to this offseason. Because there still are some holes, and there still are some question marks. And with the NFL draft less than three weeks away, it's, it's more and more in my brain of, okay, can Goody do it again? I have faith he can hit on a couple of the spots, especially in year one and year two. But can he have as great of a draft as he had last year with – that many guys contributing that early, I, I just I, I want to say yes. I just think it's so hard to do because if you look at last year's draft and think about how many guys actually contributed early, like Lucas Van Ness, the first-round pick, I don't think he was a huge contributor. He had, he had some nice plays. But I more look at the Anthony Johnson Jr., the Carrington Valentine in, in the late rounds. And then you have – Guys like Carl Brooks, who had some really nice flashes uh, in the middle rounds. And then, obviously, Jaden Reed, Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft. All of those guys I just named contributed pretty extensively, especially toward the end of the regular season. I just have no idea if Goody can do it again at linebacker and at safety and some cornerback depth and offensive line depth that they desperately need in the draft coming up in a couple of weeks. So... As much of a rebuild and retool as the Packers succeeded with a year ago, I've just been in my own head this weekend, and I'm rarely pessimistic or negative when it comes to the Packers. I'm just wondering, eh, can they do it again in the 2024 NFL draft? Because what Goody did a year ago, I, I want to call it unprecedented, but we saw the Texans do it too. 
with the receivers they had on that staff. And obviously winning, or two of their players winning both the offensive and defensive rookie of the year, and winning a playoff game coming off the three-win season. The Packers no longer are viewed as an underdog. They're now viewed as a team that can legitimately compete in the NFC North and can legitimately compete for an NFC championship. Jordan Love is viewed as one of the top eight or five best quarterbacks in the league. He's top five in MVP odds this upcoming season. So now that the expectations are higher, is this thing a foregone conclusion that the Packers are not pretenders but true contenders in the NFC? That's the question I wonder, and I definitely don't have the answer to quite yet. Hunter, am I overreacting? Am I getting too in my own head as we lead up to the NFL draft in a couple of weeks? Part of me wants to say, no, you're not because of the draft last year. But I just keep thinking about how many GMs regularly will have like one or two good drafts and then they've got some really bad ones. You know, you mentioned I am a Cowboys fan for anyone watching in Milwaukee uh, who hasn't tuned into the show before. And, you know, they have Taco Charlton first round draft Such picks. Such a great name, by the way. It, it was. He was just never a even okay player. Uh, that's true. And just a great name. That's just the way that it works, though, is that if you're a GM, you're going to have really bad drafts and you're going to have really good ones. If he can follow up this last draft with another even average or good draft, you're talking about Goody being potentially like a Hall of Fame level GM just because of what that's going to do with this already really good Packers team to where, okay, they make a run. He gets with the pieces he brought in, he gets them into a Super Bowl. And he's going into the Hall of Fame because that's just the way GMs are is no one remembers those really bad drafts as long as you get you hit on Jordan Love and you get a couple of other really good players, potentially somehow somebody is somehow a Hall of Fame level player, and suddenly you're one of the greatest GMs ever. All it takes is two guys at that that spot in an organization and suddenly you're one of the GOATs. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I mean, it'll, it'll remain to be seen what Jordan Love ultimately is. I, I don't know that many people are as high on Jordan Love as I am, right? Like, I was, I was ready to write his ticket to the Hall of Fame week one of, uh, of last year after a, a nice performance. After he said he was going to win the MVP by beating the Bears. Okay, now, it was the debut episode of the show uh, when we still used the whiteboard way back when. And I wrote my notes that you now see on the right side of the screen on a whiteboard. And... After week one of the season, Jordan Love was leading the MVP race. Statistically, he was the best quarterback in the NFL. And it's a quarterback award. I know how silly it sounds, but and I thought it sounded silly at the time. But after the first week of the season, Jordan Love was leading the MVP race. And now look look at what all the odds makers say. They say, hey, Strofe is a damn genius because he's number five in MVP odds for this year. They're not saying you're a genius because of what you said in week one. They're saying that Jordan Love has earned that based off of the totality of a season, but, not one if, performance against a terrible defense. But if you look at the totality of the season, he had, he had a really crappy October. There were points early on in the season, or actually midway through the season, where I was scratching my head saying, ah, I don't know if he's the guy. I don't know if we did it again. And then all of a sudden, November, December, January rolls around. It's like, holy crap, they did it again. So, yeah, I, 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 I think that'll be interesting to watch, you know, if he's able to piece together the entirety of a really solid season after what was a terrific second half. I think he has the it factor, but it took him a couple of years to develop that uh, behind Aaron Rodgers. And obviously that's a beneficial spot, right? Sitting behind a first ballot Hall of Famer is ultimately going to help you in the long run. And uh, I saw a picture from them over the weekend as they were playing in a charity flag football game together, arm in arm in the picture, right next to each other, Rodgers and Love. They maintain a solid relationship as much of a kook as Aaron Rodgers is. So there you go. Uh, Better than 4-12. and 12. Uh, Yes. It took them a while. Yeah, it did. It did take them a while. You're right. It, it, that was Rodgers' first year, right? 4-12 and 12 as the starter? No, I was saying number 4 and number 12's relationship. Oh. Well, I think that it was a 5-11. and 11. Rogers' first year wasn't very good record-wise. Well, so. Yeah, and I was just saying that Rodgers' relationship and 12, with... Rogers, I got you. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Took um, you a bit. It did. I got there. I'm kind of an idiot. We've established this kind of. before. Um, so, But I, I saw a, a question pop across on TikTok, and I, I, I know he isn't actually a sophomore because it's his fifth season. 
But somebody asking, do you think love hits the sophomore slump? And I'm a firm believer in uh, you typically you typically don't stay standard your sophomore year. And this applies to a lot of the other pieces on the offense is you, you either make the sophomore jump or you take a sophomore slump. And I think there are some pieces that are due for a slump. Um, as much as I hate to say it, one of those tight ends is going to regress, probably at least statistically. Um, Jaden Reed, is he able to take what he did a year ago and elevate that to another level? I sure hope so. But is it a given? Yeah, I don't know. Carrington Valentine defensively? I think he's the winner. Uh, if you're going to say a, of, of a slump. I think Jaden yeah. Reed is the – is going to take a step up. I hope so. Just because the way they used him, like you can, they were intentionally going out of their way yeah. to get him the ball. Matt LaFleur is a good enough offensive mind that he's going to force that and figure out ways to get him involved in every game. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, we will talk more Packers coming up later in the week as we get ready for the NFL draft coming up in a couple of weeks. But I want to move on to the Milwaukee Bucks because they have now regressed, speaking of regression, have regressed back to pre-All-Star levels. They have lost four in a row. There are four games remaining in the regular season for the Bucks: Two against the Magic, a playoff team. One against the Celtics, the best team in the East, and one against the Oklahoma City Thunder, who are only a game back of the Western Conference first seed. They're technically number three in the West right now. So not an easy schedule to round out the regular season for the Milwaukee Bucks. We've done this several times throughout the course of the regular season, dating back all the way to when Adrian Griffin was still the head coach of this team. Hunter, I'll ask you in a minute where your panic meter is at on a scale from 1 to 10. This is not good. I am officially ready to hit the panic button. I've been chill the whole season. I said, yeah, they're good enough. They'll figure it out. But they can't hit a slump like this. Four games left. The regular season ends next Sunday. This ain't good. Or this Sunday, I think the regular season ends. This is not good. Four games left in the regular season. Playoffs start soon. And they're playing the worst basketball they have since the All-Star break. It seems like Doc Rivers has lost control, and maybe respect, just like Adrian Griffin did. The defense has regressed back to horrible levels. Uh, the three-point shots aren't falling the way they ha have been. Each of those losses, they've allowed over 110 points. I'm at a six. I don't think they lose in the first round, but they could. I, what did I say? Only like two and a half games separate the. They're currently the two seed still, but only two and a half games separate them from the six seed. And again, three of those four games remaining, two against the Magic, one against the Celtics, are against teams that are in the playoffs in the Eastern Conference. So that that games that separate that line is very very thin. That ice is very thin for the Milwaukee Bucks. I'm at a six out of ten. Hunter, where are you at? Uh, I'm at a zero. What? I've disassociated from the team. <laughs> I, I just can't. They lost to the Raptors. The Raptors are and outwardly the trying to lose games. Yep. Like, I, I'm just done. There's no uh, reason they should be losing that game. Like, I just, I'm, I'm over it. I'm on to baseball. I just can't. I just, it's not worth it. I've had too much pain this year <laughs> as a sports fan to just do it again. So I'm just, I'm done. I don't care. Wizards, Grizzlies, Raptors, back to back to back they lost pathetic to yeah, that's really bad and i know they were without Giannis. i think it was that raptors game doesn't matter they're still a better roster yeah but you can't put a ton of stock into a game without Giannis. Uh, they're I a, am a team trying that. to lose strofe i understand that. like come on and they <laughs> lost by six like it's so bad they're just a bad team, yeah, it, and I'm just I'm just done. I just don't okay, want to do it. So clearly, you haven't disassociated as much as you've as much as you claim to. Do you think they lose in the first round? Absolutely, they're going to get yeah. Miami. They're going to get swept. Okay. It won't even be a gentleman's sweep. Like, like it it's last going year. to yeah. be forty point beatdowns because Jimmy Butler. As soon as it becomes the playoffs, he becomes Himmy Butler, and it's just going to be awful. And I hate it, and that's why I'm just I'm over it. I'm done. I'm on to baseball. Christian Yelich is back. Yeah, Let's that's go. That's a fact. He is. He is indeed back. Uh, nice win yesterday. A little bit prettier than the loss they took on Saturday when I was there, but neither here nor there for the Brewers. I I just don't know what to do with Doc. I don't think you could fire him. No, no you, shot. You can't you can't pay four head coaches going into next season because you're still paying Budenholzer. You're still paying Griffin. You'd be paying Rivers, who signed, I think, a three-year deal. 
they're just not a scary team like they should be. Right? You have Giannis, Dame, Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez. On paper, that to me is, oh boy, that's championship recipe. And now they lose four in a row, three of which are those horrible teams we just mentioned. Wizards, Raptors, Wizards, or Wizards, Raptors, uh, who am I missing in there now uh, that they, they lost to? That's horrible. Grizzlies. So I, <sighs> they, they got to get a couple wins here in their last four. They got to beat some playoff teams in order to give me any sort of confidence. But yeah, I'm with you because they could go th- you know, one and three here, fall to the five seed, and then have to visit Cleveland. Ugh. And, and I don't like their chances there. I don't really like their chances against anybody. Because as it stands right now, they're the two seed. And they've clinched a playoff spot despite the loss last night. But they're only a game up on Orlando for the two seed. And again, two of their last four games are against Orlando. So that could easily flip-flop very quickly. But let's just say they stay the two seed. They'd have to play one of these two teams in the first round. Philadelphia, who's got a healthy Joel Embiid back. Or Miami, whoever wins the 7-8 matchup in the play-in tournament. If the playoffs started today. I don't like their matchups against either of those teams. So I do not like the Bucks' chances as it stands right now. But, it, but let's just say, let's just say for the sake of the argument, they go 4-0. They beat the Celtics, they beat the Magic both times, they beat the Thunder. Similarly to how they started out of the All-Star break, where they beat the Thunder and they beat the Wolves. Maybe you like your chances then. I don't know. But I'm at a 6 out of 10. We'll check back in on this later in the week. All right, double whammy. For what Strofe learned as we wrap up the show, a couple of things from over the weekend. Uh, actually, triple whammy for what Strofe learned. A couple of things from over the weekend. I haven't even mentioned WrestleMania yet. Aren't you proud you of me? You don't have to. Aren't, but you should be proud of me. I am, but you really don't have to. I'm just saying this. You say Christian Yelich is back. So is John Cena. All right, that's that's one. All right, number two, Bo Ryan will be inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame after uh, after it was officially he was officially voted in uh, over the over the weekend, and obviously long overdue. Terrific track record coaching at NIA, uh, NAIA level, Division three level, Division one level, UW Milwaukee, UW Madison, back to back Final Fours a decade ago for the Badgers. It's long overdue, but Bo Ryan headed to the Hall of Fame. So that is uh, what I learned. Number one. Over the weekend, he'll be inducted in mid-August alongside 12 other inductees. What I learned, number three, is actually what Hunter learned. And we we enjoy a good tinfoil hat on this show. Yeah. We've, we've thrown a tinfoil hat on or two uh, in our day. And Hunter, you sent me an, an article from Forbes, I believe, or Business Insider. One of the, I'm looking at the Forbes article. And... So there was, there was an earthquake in New York, and New Jersey area, over the weekend. I think it was on Friday. And today is the solar eclipse. First one in seven years, last one in the contiguous U.S. for 20 years. Next one will be in 2044. There are studies going around that say solar eclipses may cause earthquakes. And we are currently in Madison and Milwaukee in the midst of like the, the the best time for the solar eclipse, I think it's about two o'clock coming up that the best time will will be. And you're supposed to wear protective eye gear. I'm not a doctor, so I'm just gonna say, hey, if you go look at it, wear protective eye gear. Forgot my sunglasses today. We'll see what I end up wearing. Yeah, don't wear just sunglasses. Oh wait, really? Yeah, they make special glasses for watching an eclipse. Don't just wear your sunglasses. Okay, now I must admit, I I wore like Dollar Tree flower glasses in 2017. I have a picture of that somewhere that didn't work very well, but my eyes felt fine. Shocking. But they felt fine. Yeah. A bad idea? Yeah, because you're staring at a giant ball of gas in the sky (laughs) that is burning at billions of degrees. Like, of course, that's a bad idea, Strofe. Is it always a bad idea? Yes. Okay. Noted. (laughs) Hey, you learn something new every day, remember? But so. Okay, so what does the correlation with earthquakes have to do? I, I read the article. Well, I still don't really get it. So it's it's it that the moon, the moon, okay. yeah, the moon, along with being a part of what causes the tides, uh, the moon also they're finding because of the how big it is and how close it is to the Earth, it does also affect earthquakes. Okay. So then that extra push and pull with the gravi- gravitational pull of the moon can also, they found, affect the crust of our Earth, which then can cause some earthquakes. Do you buy it? I mean, they've... 
from what I've said, they've said on here, this, these geologists are like, yeah, there's like with where the moon is positioned and where earthquakes can happen, like there is an effect that it has, which would make like, I don't know. It makes sense to me. It isn't enough where I'm like, oh, the, the world's going to end or anything weird like that. And the eclipse isn't going to do anything weird. Yeah. But I was just like, oh, I didn't realize that the moon would have that effect on our planet. If, if you didn't work in sports media. You'd be a really good history teacher. That's what I originally went to school at UW-River Falls for before I had a .94 GPA and <laughs> was asked to not go back to school. How do you even accomplish that, a .94, um, just not going to class? Yeah, not going to class, a lot of drinking. Yeah. It, was, it was bad. I was not a good student my first try. Shout out River Falls. Shout out Wyack. All right. Um, well, uh, I feel for Josh DiMaggio, who, I, who I'm, I'm, I'm hoping will text me momentarily, because I'm going to ask him this question. Anybody that was along with us today, do you feel stupider now than you did 50 minutes ago? Because I certainly do. It's one of those days. I spilled coffee everywhere this morning, Hunter. It's just what? a case of the Mondays. It happens. All right. Big thanks to Jack Golke. Big thanks to Josh DiMaggio. Big thanks to Tiny Hands for helping us out today, as always. Um, I hope my brain cells are better Wednesday. Uh, we'll be in better shape for Wednesday as we, uh, we wrap up the college basketball season. Uh, enjoy the college hoops tonight. UConn-Purdue National Championship game. I think UConn wins big. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe Zach Eady can get it done, uh, unlike Caitlin Clark, the two biggest stars in college basketball the last couple of years. We'll be back with you Wednesday at 1230, wrapping up the college basketball season, looking ahead to the NFL draft a bit uh, with you here on ESPN Milwaukee YouTube, on ESPN Madison Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, ESPN Madison, TikTok as well. Thanks for hanging with us today. We'll talk to you Wednesday. It's Mr. Relevant. I'm Alex Stroh. Peace.